full credit. No problem. Same as getting. No question. No problem at all. We're done talking here about this tomorrow. That is correct. I will be, I'll agree with that. But if he is not a son, he's a very correct. The only one that is, will be punished or rewarded. A lot of people try to get... Oh, but here, uh, if the only one that would be punished or rewarded is the one that's commanded to do it. But there's no re relevant punishment rewarding anybody if they're not the uh, apprentice. God will not punish a boy. So it depends on what you're commanded. If you're commanded to do things, then you are vulnerable. You can be rewarded or punished. The thesis is saying the only one that's commanded in this thing is not the uh, woman, but the man. So he is vulnerable and he could be. Not saying necessarily would be. The trouble is that there's a big, just like nowadays, of course, there's a big uh, expenditure of money that is involved preparing for a wedding. A lot of times you have a wedding that involves a tremendous expenditure. I don't know about if you've gone through many weddings. So you understand what it is. It, it, it really takes a chunk out of your bankroll. And uh, you can't just simply say postpone it unless there's a legitimate reason. And later on we'll learn one of the parents of the bride and groom dies right there when you're ready to get married. And so the rabbis put the dead body in a separate room and they go through with the ceremony because they did the expenditure thing. I remember when I was a yeshiva buffer and there was such a wedding that happened like that. And one of the uh, uh, parents of the one of the five group died. So nobody had the appetite to eat the meal. But the next day, the yeshiva buffer had the meal. We ate the meal that they would have had uh, that day for the wedding because they wouldn't want to throw away the food for nothing. So it does happen, but what the, I'm, I'm saying here, just emphasize the fact uh, there is either a punishment or a reward given only to one that's commanded to do mitzvahs. Now, that's what I'm trying to emphasize. But, well, if he doesn't, he doesn't do it intentionally. If he's boxed out by God, God will not punish him for that. If he intends to do mitzvahs and he happens to not be able to do this well, whatever it was, there was a postponement of the whoever it was. She got sick, he got sick, she got sick, he don't, whatever the reason is, the fact is that there was a postponement, only if he has a track record, I think. We're oh. talking, oh, that's only, that's true. I'm sure we're wrong. Uh, uh, the, oh. A bad thought, ordinarily, is not sufficient to constitute a sin. But in the area of worshiping idols, a bad thought is the, again, there's nothing that happens to a person unless God decrees it to happen to him. And not necessarily for this mitzvah. He may be punished for something else he did. He doesn't live in isolation. That's because he was a righteous type that was constantly trying to do mitzvahs. There's no question about it. Such a person will be given credit by God. But we're not talking necessarily every person like that. Most people are benoni. They're, they're not. They're, they're rishoyim. So they can't really make a, a substitution every time I attempt to do a mitzvah. Oh, you bring me a time of Messiah law. You bring me a proof. Oh, wonderful. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to, Rosh, that you just alluded to, is <laughs> saying this, in effect. Uh, if a person has a relationship with God, and he's still able to function, to learn Torah or to do, or to daven, and he investigates his own actions, his prior actions, he finds he hasn't done anything that he can imagine that was wrong. So it must be Yisurim Shalavo. What's Yisurim Shalavo? Higher trials and relations from God, not for others, not for a punishment, but because God wants to elevate this person spiritually and make him even a higher degree of spirituality, like, for instance, they did with Abraham Avino, we know, and with Yaakov Avino. Yeah, with all, all the great Sadiqim, all the great Sadiqim. He makes them higher in spirituality because every time they accept the decree of God, even though most people would, would, would be complaining about it, but they accept it with the greatest love, they, this, is, this is a tremendous vehicle for God to multiply beyond our comprehension the reward of person. Yeah, that, that, that's at the end of the Gemara and, and, and the prophets. Yes, yes. I'm glad you finally came to my... Thank you very much. I'm not saying that I have to be right. I couldn't prove it to be wrong. Baruch Hashem, I don't know everything. But I want to, uh, I want you to do it. God doesn't do anything just like that.
If a person is constantly striving to do mitzvahs, mitzvah gererus mitzvah, one mitzvah after another, God gives you more opportunity to mitzvah. You're trying to do averus? Where do you get that to be able to do mitzvahs? You box yourself up by this way. Well, we'll tell you where you left off today. What about, okay? What about These are losses that really, uh, we have to be predominant to God every day. It's November 3rd. It's very good to know of uh, these difficulties. All you have to do is look for what says Ambrosius. I mean, excuse me. Last time we had learned the first mission was talking about when are you, when do you say Kriya Shema Shel Arvi? The evening is talking about when do you say Kriya Shema in the So once we disposed of the evening, well, then we need to discuss the morning. You might ask the question, the Gemara asked the question, why do we start that way? Why can't we first discuss the morning? Then it's just evening. The Gemara gives several fruits. It was evening and it was morning, one day. So, whatever the reason is, we're learning it. And this Mishnah is the second Mishnah in the first chapter in all of Rojo. It, it asks the question, uh, the Mishnah says, when do, from what time do we say to Krishna in, in the morning? Obviously, gentlemen, we've learned already in the first Mishnah, that you can say the Kriya Shema in the evening all the way up to the time of Olaf HaShachar. So, actually, al Pidin, you could say Kriya Shema in the morning after Olaf HaShachar. So there's a possibility, the Gemara says, where you can take two times Kriya Shema within minutes of each other and fulfill your mitzvah of saying it the proper time for both times. But that is only uh, in the most extreme circumstances that we would dominate that early. Ordinarily, we try to say Kriya Shema around sunrise, which is of course much later than Olas HaShachar. And there are different opinions when the Olas HaShachar occurs. So it says like, Mamos HaShachar, from what time do we say the Kriya Shema in the morning? When a person can recognize the difference between the Chilas, they used to have a dye that they used to dye one, some of the uh, tzitzis, chalas, which is some kind of a purple, uh, bluish. If you can distinguish between that and white, so obviously the, there has to be a big enough light to can distinguish between those two colors. There, we'll learn that uh, actually we're talking about a, a wool that was dyed, but the dye didn't reach all the areas of the wool. So sometimes there are certain areas of the wool that has a very uh, deep uh, dye, and then others has a very superficial dye, dye color. And sometimes that superficial dye color is, is very difficult, is that and regular white, because it's very insufficient. And sometimes you need a very great light to be able to see it. If the light is lighter, you can distinguish between the Chanova, there's other uh, ways to say that. Uh, Another way is that we'll learn that, that if you can recognize uh, an acquaintance, it's too dark, you can't recognize the other person, but if you can recognize an acquaintance within a certain amount of distance, we'll discuss that. And uh, then that's another sign why you, it's a proper time to dominate Kriyashma in the morning. That's one thing. And then it goes on to say, Rebbe Ezer says, Bein Tzachelis Lakarte. If you can recognize the difference between Tzachelis, which we said was a purplish, bluish dye, like a greenish uh, dye. Uh, green and uh, blue is almost the same. Uh, and if it's in the dark, it's very hard to distinguish them. All right, so that's when you can start uh, saying the Kriya Shema. And you can finish it, uh, you should finish it on Nezachoma, when the sun rises. That is the ideal time to do it. You recall when Yosef Atzadik went to meet his father, Yaakov, when he was, Yaakov was coming down to Mitzrayim, that he, he made his chariot early and he ran out to greet his father as he's coming into the land. And uh, he fell on the neck of his father and cried, but his father didn't cry in turn because his father was saying Kriya Shema at that time. So from this, uh, his father had not seen him in 22 years and he loved him very much. But yet he loved God more than he loved his son that he loved very much. This is a, 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 a soyim, but it was a test. And it was at the sunrise when Yaakov, you know, to say the Krishma. And we have, we have a general rule that Mara says, the pious ones in the uh, in earlier days would, would always try to go and make it the Krishma that they said 
just was said at, at sunrise at that time. That was considered a very, it still is, of course. And the trouble is not too many people get up early enough to do it. Of course, if you go to show on a steady basis, then it's, uh, it shouldn't be too much of a problem. But in the winter mornings, we, we daven half an hour, sometimes an hour before sun rises. We have to have a tailing that we can daven at that early hour if we have to go to work, say, for instance, or some other reason that we have to leave early. Otherwise, we're boxed out from davening. And we wouldn't want that to happen if we can avoid it. Rabbi Yeshua, Mayor Rabbi Yeshua says, Ad Sholoshos, you have up to three hours into the day to daven Kriyashma, of Shachris. Now, if the day, as we say, is 12 hours, the day uh, would be, say, for instance, the day started at 6 a.m. and ended at 6 p.m., 12 hours. So, according to Rabbi Yeshua, you would be able to daven until 9 a.m. Krishma Shachris. We will learn later that davening Philo that you have up to a third of the day. This is up to a day, Kriya Shema Shachris. You have up to a third of the day. So if you stay, say the day starts at 6 a.m. and ends at 6 p.m., you would have up to 10 a.m. to say it. According, that's a, a rule of thumb. No, it's only up to 9 o'clock. You stay up to three hours into the day. Now, when we talk about hours, we're not talking about hours that are necessarily 60 minutes long. What we're really talking about is three twelfths of that day, whatever that day it is. There are twice during the year when the hours are exactly 12 hours, at the uh, beginning of the spring and the beginning of the fall. But otherwise, the days are usually either shorter or longer. Can you say that's true later than Yes. How much later can you, are you allowed? Up to now, we're talking about just ten. Ten. 9 to 10, but actually there are others that go, you've been diving all the way up to uh, Akinami, but we're talking about when is the limit that you can dive. and we'll discuss all that. So one mission after another flushes it out. But uh, what I'm telling you right now is, when we're talking about hours, we're not talking about the hours we know, necessarily 60 minutes. The hour could be 45 minutes, or it could be 75 minutes when we're talking about an hour. What we're really talking about is one twelfth of the day period, that, uh, that particular day period. There are some days that are only nine hours long, the light, and some days that are 15 hours long. So obviously their section would be either smaller or bigger. When we're talking about hours, that's what we're talking about. We're not talking less necessarily. Of course, twice during the year, it's actually exactly the same thing, but otherwise, it's either bigger or smaller. It is the way of the sons of kings to stand up after three hours into the day. And we are Jews, are considered sons of kings. We are not all nobility. We have Gomorrah, there's Gomorrah and Shabbos, that we are all kings. If you bring me Gomorrah Shabbos, I wouldn't want you to live through your life and not realize your royalty. Shabbos. It says the word Shabbos on it, the Shas Gomorrah. All right, gentlemen. It's one of the bigger Thomas uh, in, in the Talmud. It's a big thing. That says Shabbos. Thank you, gentlemen. There's still nothing wrong with that. Win in meditation, of course. We have a, a Mishnah in Shabbos in Kuf Yudalas. 111 on the first side. It says, Rabbi Shimon, Omer, Rabbi Shimon says, Ko Yisrael b'nei All Jews are the sons of kings. There it is, gentlemen. I'm not making it up. It's right here. On 111, on the first side, right there. It says, we're the sons of kings. And we are not, we don't, we don't just like the peasants. They get up early in the morning and it's, we have a certain royal privilege. One of them is to get up a little later. I, I know some people that are really sons of kings. They really get up very <laughs> ordinarily. So we give a leeway. We can learn the war, but I don't, I don't want to discuss it this time. I just wanted you to know the phraseology, sons of kings, of 
sacrifice the Jewish people. 